My name's Nearet. Yeah, weird name. I, I know. And I tried paid DMing for an entire year. How did it go? Am I still doing it? Should you do it? I'd love to tell you, but YouTube needs this video to be like eight minutes long. So uh, let me regale you with the tale of how it all started. One year ago, I decided to sign up on startplayinggames.com. Before that, I was DMing for, for free as a regular ass DM for about four years, on and off, because I kept burning out. I wasn't sure why. After some time and some self-reflection, I realized what was missing. And the answer to that led me to signing up on startplayinggames.com. I'll get to what that answer was later in the video, because it's a plot hook. It keeps you watching. Okay, first. Let's talk about startplayinggames.com, which I'll refer to you from here on out as SPG, because that name is a mouthful, right? It's a website where you can list games, paid or free, and players can sign up either instantly or after you accept them. If we ignore the entire paid portion of the site, it's basically a site where you can easily track the games you're running and playing in. For that, it's great, even if you never plan to charge a single dollar. Now you can instantly schedule out games and send out information to your players in one place. And as a player, you've got a site you can browse to easily find games. So for that, it's pretty great. Aside from some weird quirks and criticisms, we'll talk about when I get to that part. So real quick history. SPG was founded in 2020 by two founders, and I'm sure some other people, but the biography says two founders, Devin and Nate. Devin is actually really vocal and he posts all the time in the SPG Discord. Really cool guy. I'm guessing Nate purposely isn't public facing because I've never heard from him, never seen him, never would have known he existed if I didn't read the about his part on the website. Anyways, they founded in 2020. <sighs> Paid DMing has been around for well, decades. But until now, it's been relegated to forums and servers, really scattered. Now it's neatly organized in an intentional format to distribute that service, to make paid DMing an easily accessible resource rather than having to know a guy. People have been paid game masters as a job, as a full-time job for decades, decades before SPG. So they didn't invent the position. They just brought it to the mainstream. And that's definitely the plan. This isn't some mom and pop website. Their intentions are totally to make paid DMing the new normal. In 2022, they raised $6.5 million through siege funding. That's a lot of VC backing behind all these paid games. In fact, according to SPG themselves, in the first two years running the platform, Game Masters have made $2.5 million combined from running over 100,000 games. So this isn't small potatoes, you know. These are very large potatoes. Now, where's that sweet, sweet corpo money going? They've been making upgrades to the site, building partnerships with almost every TTRPG that isn't D&D, and recently been paying for sponsored ad placement, especially on TikTok and YouTube. You may have seen your favorite content creator uh, do like an ad read for them lately. They've been pushing that really hard. But what I've seen uh, their money go towards the most is one thing, Facebook ads. Couldn't decide what to do with my hands at the last minute, you know? SPG has pumped a lot of money into letting people know about their site with targeted ads of listed games. So someone will see the SPG ad on their Facebook page and the ad itself talks about SPG, but also links directly to a game listing, usually a paid one. And the plan is for the targeted customer to sign up for that game. Now listen, I don't have the conversion numbers, obviously, but apparently it's been working so well that they've pretty much been doing that for the first three years before like expanding out into TikTok, YouTube, and all the other places. The craziest part of this whole thing for me is early on when I first started doing the paid GMing thing, I found out from other PGMs that have been doing this way longer than I have on SPG, that these paid GMs do no marketing on their own. They just focus on fine tuning their listing and SPG funnels prospective customers their way, primarily through the Facebook ad method. And at the time of this video, that's pretty much still true. But I have a feeling that'll change as SPG becomes more and more mainstream. We've arrived at the part where I actually start my review. Congratulations on enduring the expedition. It's not a good session if there isn't five minutes of the DM monologuing in the beginning, right? I'm just doing my job. So I'm gonna prevent naming specific people or leave out any details that might further identify them. The point of this SPG review is to gauge, gauge this whole site as a whole. 
not any lone individuals. So things will be kept vague for that reason. So we're going to break this review down into two parts. My experience as a player, because I do love using it as a player. I love playing games as much as I love running them. And then finally, my experience as a GM making money running games. So let's talk about the player side of SPG, right? <clears throat> Man, let's talk about the good stuff first. I don't know about you, but I hate the traditional way of finding games. Scouring forums like LFG, Roll20, filling out application after application filled with questions that have nothing to do with roleplay. Why do you care about my gender, my age, my race, as long as you know I'm over 18? Uh, to me, it just feels like tools used to discriminate. Anyways, those questions aside, you fill out all the other ones about your experience, what you're looking for in a game, blah, 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 and then you wait and hope you get selected by the uh, GM's arbitrary standards. And let's say you do get selected. You probably have little to no idea if the DM is actually good or not, or if they're responsible with that power. There's a whole subreddit dedicated to DMs that are bad at power management, or if they'll even be consistent. The DM that quits after a few sessions is practically a cliche, right? Me, before I started doing this thing. <laughs> and before you know it, the group breaks apart and you're back to square one again. This process sucks. And the problems of the industry-wide GM shortage only make it worse. More people want to play D&D than ever before. More people want to play TTRPGs as a whole more than ever before. Back when I ran free games, I would get around 100 responses on average per game listing I put up. 100 on average for like a game where the group is four to five people. <laughs> At that point, filling an application feels less like an audition and more like a lottery. But there's just simply not enough free GMs out there to facilitate that demand. I'm guessing the people behind SPG saw the issue everyone else did and decided to improve the process using a simpler tool, money. So yeah, as long as you're willing to cough a few bucks or not so few, you're basically guaranteed a spot in a game. Just don't be a creeper or weirdo and you'll qualify for 99% of the games on SPG. As long as you have the cash, of course. First question you're probably asking right now. Near it, how do I know these gems are any good? I don't know why I assumed you're a vampire. Anyways, see, that's the first problem I want to talk about. Right now, they've got this really rudimentary rating system. Players can leave a review of a GM with a simple thumbs up or thumbs down, along with a few sentences describing their experience. When you make a rating system that's so, that's so binary, people are going to lean either negatively or positively, depending on the situation, depending on the industry. In this case, when it comes to this site, they mostly tend to lean positive, meaning even critical reviews will end with a simple thumbs up because, well, people don't want to be a jerk. What does this mean overall? I'm overacting, I'm sorry. What does this mean overall? It means in a sea of overwhelming positivity, it's super difficult to figure out which GM is the fit for you. When every single review says, this GM is the best GM ever, <laughs> how do you choose? And the thing is, a better rating system wouldn't even help because GM isn't a linear scale. I've been at tables where everyone is having a blast and I'm trying not to fall asleep. <laughs> it's less about if a GM is good or bad and more if they're a good fit for you. To remedy this, SPG is now starting to ask their players to use tags to describe GMs like visual or storyteller or teacher or creative or top, wrong website. But it's a band-aid if you ask me. I'd redo the rating system entirely. I'm almost get rid of it, <laughs> honestly. Spend less time telling me if the GM is decent and spend more time telling me how they like to do things. Are they a war gamer? Are they very immersive theater role player? Are they sort of natural explorer, improv style kind of guy? Uh, do they enjoy dungeon crawling that sort of thing? That would help let me know what I'm getting into. Because right now, you're basically going off the listing and if the GM decides to tell you what their style is or not. Maybe a quick FAQ the GM can answer. Like uh, if a player asks how they rule certain things, the GM can say, oh, I like to rule things such and such, things of that nature. Or a dedicated spot for a short video clip where the GM can include a snippet of them running a session. Or just saying hello as a video. 
just throwing out some ideas. The reason I'm bringing up the rating system being poor is that unfortunately, SPG has zero requirements to sign up to be a GM. And I get it, actually. Um, how would you assess a GM's worthiness to be on the site? A written test? A godly oath? Scout's honor? Like, it, it, it's tough. But the reality is that in the current system, bad GMs will get a few games in and ruin a few people's days before they get booted out, before the system kicks in. Or even worse, a new player might get their perception of TTRPGs ruined and spoiled as a whole because they pick the bad GM to give them their first RPG horror story of a session. As of now, SPG is sort of taking GMs on their word that they're not jerks and letting the market decide. And that seems intentional. For better or for worse, SPG has taken a mostly hands-off approach, where other listing sites such as Fiverr or Etsy or Amazon are pretty high maintenance. And this is nice, because aside from their listing and merchant standards and a few TOS-specific requirements, enforcements, you're welcome to run your pro DMing like it's your own business. Run the sort of game you want using the system you want with the VTT you want at the price and length you want. You can do it your way just like BK, but that food sucks and the SPG is pretty cool. I've seen everything from fully homebrewed adventures to published modules to recreations of popular anime to the most obscure TTRPGs to, uh, well, adult content. That's right. And they're few and far between, but at the moment you can essentially charge people for erotic roleplay. What you think of that is up to your personal opinion, but I'd like to think almost everyone would agree that sort of content should be its own site, or at least require an age gate, which it doesn't right now. Sure, as a DM, you could and should ask if someone is 18, but short of asking for their ID, you wouldn't know for sure. Anyways, <laughs> that's a whole other headache. Not, I'm not getting into that. That issue aside, the hands-off approach is mostly a good thing. SPG nurtures its community through grassroots style outreach, which is great. SPG still has that personal feeling despite being a multi-million dollar company. It's not uncommon for Devin or another SPG employee to casually chime in on a conversation. That's pretty cool. Though, the hands-off approach is a double-edged sword when it comes to players. Every GM's onboarding style is different. And while GMing is subjective, having good customer service isn't. If you're a free GM, who cares, play it lax. But when you start taking money for this thing, there's a higher standard. I've joined games where the DM has taken up to two days to respond to me. Sometimes I don't get to play that week because they just took too long to get to me. Thankfully, that's the worst I've experienced in terms of personal encounters with bad DMs, but I've heard and read some horror stories. The silver lining is all the stories are about a GM being rude or not as attentive. Nothing truly awful or life ruining, thankfully. Everyone's comfort levels are different, and I've been at some tables where the line of professionalism blurs. I've been at tables where the GM admits they're high, or they trauma dump onto their players, or they promise to give your PC a cool rare item in exchange for a good review, of course. Yeah, um, not stuff I'm comfortable with, but everyone's different. Fortunately, even in my worst sessions, every single GM has offered player safety tools and adhered to them in play. So, Job well done, guys. At least for that. <laughs> uh, but let me reiterate. But let me reiterate. But let me reiterate. <sighs> but let me reiterate. 90% of the sessions I attended as a player were great. No problems. So as a player, the site is at a point where you definitely can't just blindly join a listing. Due diligence on behalf of the player is still definitely recommended. Check out the listing thoroughly as well as the GM's profile and their reviews. And don't feel compelled to stay any longer than you want to. If it's not right after the first session, let the GM know and take your leave. And yes, I do recommend letting the GM know that you're leaving the table, unless it's like a super volatile situation. Um, as always, SPG support is available should things progress past the point of a in-table discussion. And as far as SPG support goes, I've actually only heard good things about them, and my experiences with them have been great. <laughs> Happy to say. Response times are solid. 
The humans on the other end seem friendly and knowledgeable and they solve the problem best they can without wasting more time than they need. They're great about removing problem GMs and reporting problem players. In fact, there is a policy regarding GMs. If you're a GM and you run a game and a player plays without paying you and they leave, SPG will cover the costs of that loss of income. They'll pay on behalf of that player as a courtesy. Can you imagine any other merchant site doing that? All right, player part over. Player part over, get a yeah. Player section over, talking about GM stuff, pro GM stuff, charging money for a dice rolling. With that out of the way, let's talk about my DM journey. Here's the condensed version. I started way back in ye olde February, 2023 with one paid game. Despite having zero reviews and zero games ran, I had my first player sign up within two weeks. Usually once you get your first player, uh, the second one isn't too far off. And then the third and then so on. It's a snowball effect, they say. First campaign went great. It was Strixhaven, a lighthearted campaign uh, set in a wizarding school that isn't uh, incredibly racist or bigoted, um, and the players enjoyed themselves. But I learned from the SPG Discord that even the most loyal table can fall apart at any time. This is what we refer to as foreshadowing. However, I had the hindsight to start two more tables. Within three months, I was running three games a week. Um, no marketing, just SPG doing their targeted uh, ad placement, primarily through Facebook, and just fine tuning my listing. Then the first table, the Strixhaven one, fell apart. Why? Well, I had done a really good job at nurturing teamwork, apparently. At one time, a player had left to become a paid gem herself, actually. With a core member gone, one by one, the others left. I've never had quite an experience like that again, fortunately. Strangely enough, that's the only time I've seen a party fall apart from a core member leaving. Anyways, I restarted the Strixhaven campaign and I bounced back with a whole new party. We're still playing to this day, but they're nearing the end. Uh, I had a system by then. I would do some light pre-prep throughout the week. Yes, pre-prep. Prep for prep. Looking over the module book, passively searching through maps to see what could work. Hey, that could be a tavern one day. Oh, this uh, alchemy workshop. I don't have a use for it right now, but it looks cool. And I could see that popping up or that sort of thing. Establishing PC narratives, talking to my players and looking at their backstories, seeing how we can flow them into the story. Then one to two hours before session, with the spirit of the incoming game at my heels and the pressure of failure on my back, I put it all together in prep. That's been working out for me ever since. Uh, moving on, payout system is great, no weird fees, and you can just do daily transfers or wait for it at the end of the week. There's a little button you click, transfer it to your bank account. Yes, the bank account is required. Money is available about 90 minutes after a session starts. So during mid-game break, actually I transfer it over. <laughs> Not only that, uh, SPG has a super handy refund button next to every single player charge. So if for whatever reason you need to do uh, a refund, it's right there. And the player gets instant website credit in the amount you refunded. No hassling support. It's solved immediately. Very cool. So for me personally, with uh, zero reviews, zero games ran, nada, nothing but a picture of my pretty face and a few paragraphs telling you about myself, um, I started at $20 per person, per session, just because uh, a few reasons. At the time, that was sort of like the, the median average price for listings. And also, that was pretty similar to like what I would make at like a, the lower end at my other job doing client work. So for me, it was like, okay, if I can't at least make that much, then it's not really worth it for me to try. That might not be the case for you. You might just be like, hey, whatever. But for me, it was just like, okay, let's see if it works at this level. And it did. And at this moment, I, after like a year of doing it, I have increased my per player price from $20 an hour to $25. And things have been going well, actually, pretty much staying in the course. Now, if you're asking how much I made in the past year, keep in mind, I started out really slow with just the one game for a few months, then three games for a few more months. I didn't really hit like full part-time regalia sort of money till like the, the nine month mark, maybe the eighth month mark. So a little bit under 10,000 from this whole thing, which is, you know, 
it's nice part-time part money. It's a, it's a nice chunk of change to help fill the gap of your financial pie chart. And uh, it, I, I, it, would, it would have been a lot more if I had been doing those five games consistently throughout the year. So yeah, it is definitely a good way to make some money. Server management is yet another hat you'll need to wear in this line of work. Every GM I've seen uses their own Discord server to host and organize games. It's pretty much required unless you want to be the only GM on Microsoft Teams. So you'll need to be handy or become handy with Discord. Now this is more like how I do things, though I have pretty strong leftist beliefs. I see the need for an apolitical space to escape from the constant sinew of it all. So that's how I ran my server. That's how I run my server to this day. All are welcome to embrace the escapism. And while I can't do anything about a player's bad day or bad week, I know I have the power to make their next four hours special. No problems with that policy yet. Don't, don't jinx me. Don't. Since you are allowed to run your business space how you please, a lot of gems Plenty of GMs actually enforce particular codes of inclusivity or bar persons of particular beliefs from their games. One example being those who are pro AI. I personally think it's fine to run your business how you want, as long as you're not violating any human rights, obviously. But the problem is, <laughs> you usually find out about this information after you joined via the Discord server rules or through session zero. So yeah, that leads to like an awkward cancellation of your campaign enrollment. So GMs need to work on making that information very present on the listing, <laughs> right in their face. Oh, and you know how when you click on a GM's profile, you get a pretty good spread of information about them. Player profiles are nothing like that. All SPG requires is a username and a password. Anything else is added of your own volition. Makes sense at this early stage in the market. You want to make the barriers of entry as low as possible. I get it. But in the future, it'd be nice to know a bit more about my players before they jump into my games. When I first started out, I did try to do some external marketing, Reddit forums, D&D discords, other D&D sites, but honestly, I didn't have any success. People are largely still defensive against paid DMing, and a lot of these spaces don't support paid GM advertising. Although fortunately in the past year, that's been changing. But like I said, most GMs don't do any marketing. Really makes you wonder how paid GMs used to do it in the past. Uh, must have been a lot harder to garner clients. I mean, Roll20's platform did support paid listings early on around 2016, but besides that, you didn't have much. Actually, now that I think about it, these early pro GMs are probably the reason a lot of these sites have anti-pro GM rules set in place, so what did you do to ruin it for all of us? Anyways, Back to my DM journey on SPG. I went from one game to three games to two games to three games in the span of six months. Slow and steady rise. Most full-time GMs I know run between somewhere of nine to 10 games a week. I, the, the highest I've heard was one GM doing 15 games a week. And boy, she said she wanted to do things that would get me demonetized to herself. But luckily she was kidding and that it was just a joke because you're all laughing at home right now, I'm sure. Most full-time GMs I know run somewhere between nine and 10 games a week. That's two games a day for the work week. That's a lot of dice rolls. Right now I'm running five games a week and I'm pretty content with that. And actually this makes me a little different from uh, most paid GMs. Most paid GMs that do this part-time or full-time usually pick like two to three published modules because it has that name brand recognition, perfect those, and then run those two to three modules over and over and over. But me, I'm stupid and I like working hard and being miserable. So I've run about 10 different modules uh, over the past year. Right now, I'm running four different modules, for example. That's not usually how DMs do it. Hell, I know some DMs that make a buck running only one module, tons of times, like a worker at Disney taking people through the same haunted house over and over and over, a hundred times a day. <laughs> Curse of Strahd has made a lot of people so much money, let me tell you. So there's a lot more I can talk about as far as like the weeds of the day-to-day -day of the paid GM lifestyle. This video, however, is uh, to give you uh, an idea of how it works and if you should do it. And the answer is, Yeah, you should, you should do it. If you want to charge money as a GM, go for it and use SPG. Whether it's one game a week, 
at five bucks a player just to cover the cost of the books or multiple games a week, charging enough cash to pay some bills, there's an entire spectrum of paid GMing that can work for you. <laughs> except, except full-time GMing. I've done the math and full-time just isn't worth the trouble. It's so much work to, well, make it work. Even the so-called full-time paid GMs I've alluded to earlier and spoke of earlier have something else going on the side. Whether it's selling their own created content on DMs Guild or uh, selling their own dice or other crafts or offering art commissions or working another gig job to round things out like DoorDash or Uber or, you know, running a YouTube channel. They do other things on the side to round things out. Don't get me wrong, there are full-time GMs that do nothing else but GM and aren't massive celebrities or famous influencers, but these GMs number in the dozens, not hundreds. It's just not a realistic pipe dream to chase after in my opinion. I myself do a lot of client work in my other job. It's only recently that paid GMing rivaled my main job in terms of income, and I don't see myself quitting that first job anytime soon. In conclusion, overall, all said and done, SPG has its issues, but most of the issues stem from SPG trusting their GMs to act responsibly on their own. Giving that sort of freedom to your contractors can be risky, but with good community management, the rewards far outweigh the risks. I only see the site as getting better. They take criticism in stride and the market has been proven. Pay jamming is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Yes, even with AI looming on the horizon. Yes, even if SPG becomes huge and everyone and their mom tries to do paid GMing, the good GMs, the ones worth the money, swim to the top and the other ones, the ones that suck or the ones that quit, sink to the bottom, just like any other trade. In the same way that people gawked at the idea of influencers or YouTubers or professional gamers earning income, Paid jamming is enduring the same rite of passage because it is a real skill set and it has value. And that was the realization I had a year ago when I first started. The reason that made me start. This had value. I was tired of putting in hours of prep for every session only for the players to half-heartedly show up muddled through my amusement park of surprises, ignoring half the hooks and almost all the story. And you know what? As soon as I attached a dollar amount to a session, players instantly became more engaged and interested because they truly want to be there. It's not just the game they happened to get approved into, it's the game they chose to pay for. And if you disagree, Try jamming yourself and say it doesn't work once you're done running a session. There's a reason hundreds of YouTubers pump out constant videos about the art of jamming, why entire books and forums and podcasts and websites and products and products and products are committed to telling you how to run a game. This is a craft, and like any other craft, done at a professional level, it deserves to be compensated. And if you still disagree, well, better get to filling out those applications. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you want to see more. Hope to see you in the comments and uh, have a good one. Bye-bye.